Well, uh, good day to everyone. Uh, we continue in our series uh, on Numbers and Deuteronomy for Beginners, Faithfulness in the Face of Challenge. This is lesson number three in the, uh, in the series, and the title of this lesson is From Sinai to Kadesh. Uh, from Sinai to Kadesh, and Lord willing, we'll cover uh, chapter five in the book of Numbers uh, through chapter 12. Well, in lesson number two, we reviewed the first census, reasons why it was taken and why only the men over 20 years of age were counted. And of course, the background and duties of the uh, Levites. We also examined the camping arrangements that God gave the people with the uh, tabernacle situated at the center of the camp. Uh, we showed you a diagram where Aaron and Moses and the priests uh, camped nearest uh, to the tabernacle and then the other Levite families camped around uh, the uh, tabernacle and then the 12 tribes, each with a specific place to camp also uh, surrounding the uh, tabernacle. And we also saw the specific order in which the Israelites broke camp and then traveled with six tribes before the uh, tabernacle, the uh, tabernacle complex uh, taken down and carried by the Levites uh, in the center of the procession and six tribes uh, following. The, uh, the class also studied the details of the roles played by both the priests and the Levites with respect to duties in the functioning of the tabernacle, uh, along with who was responsible for dismantling and carrying the separate parts of uh, the tabernacle itself. So today in this session, uh, we will among other things, review the purity laws given by Moses, including the Nazarite vow. And we'll look at uh, the crucial event that changed the direction of the people's lives in the desert from just a few weeks, they were only supposed to be in the desert a few weeks, to 40 long years traveling and living in the, uh, in the wilderness. And so we begin with the uh, general content of uh, chapters uh, five to 12. Of course, since we have uh, limited time uh, to complete both of these books, uh, we're going to begin with a summary of the contents of each chapter and then comment further on several of the activities that might require further information that is not provided by other biblical references. For example, we have detailed information about the procedure to offer sacrifice and ritual rules to uh, maintain ceremonial purity in the book of Leviticus, but there's no information about the test for marital infidelity mentioned here in chapter five. So we're going to provide a little more information for this topic when we get to uh, verses 11 to 31 of chapter five. So let's begin with the chapter five and the content of that chapter. First of all, there's uh, information about purity in the camp itself, chapter five, one to four. This uh, chapter addresses the removal of anyone with an infectious disease, a discharge, or who is ceremonially unclean due to contact with a dead body uh, from the camp. This was significant as it stressed the holiness of the community and of course the need to maintain ritual purity. I'll be mentioning this quite often through the entire lesson, uh, maintaining ritual purity while they lived in close quarters. Another uh, piece of information, another uh, topic in this uh, chapter is restitution for wrongs, uh, chapter five, verses five to 10. Here instructions are given for making restitution for wrongs committed against one another emphasizing the importance of social harmony and responsibility. Now, uh, these instructions underline the importance of justice and accountability, and also reinforcing uh, a social and divine order. You have to remember, uh, there was no police force. Uh, there were no jails uh, among the people. So it was important that there be a mechanism to deal with crime or injustice within the camp, and this chapter has some of that information. Then there's the interesting uh, information about uh, the test for an unfaithful wife, uh, chapter 5, 11 to 31. Uh, this is a ritual, uh, this test rather, was a ritual 
to determine the guilt or the innocence of a wife who was accused of uh, adultery. This reflects the concerns for familial integrity and of course the social order within the camp. This ritual aimed to address suspicions of infidelity and of course to restore family and communal harmony, reflecting the values that are placed on marriage uh, and trust uh, within families. And so the test for infidelity uh, is described in Numbers 5, 11 to 31. Uh, often it was referred to as the trial by ordeal uh, of the suspected unfaithful wife or the sota, the sota uh, ritual. It was a, a unique process in ancient Israelite society that was used when a husband suspected, had no proof, but suspected his wife of adultery. However, he had no witnesses to prove her guilt. And so uh, this ritual involved several symbolic actions, including the woman drinking a, a concoction made up of uh, holy water that was mixed with dust from the tabernacle floor and the ink from a curse uh, that was written by a priest. And so the nature of the ritual, whether it actually determined guilt uh, or was merely a method to seek closure, uh, has been interpreted in various ways. And I want to kind of share the various interpretations with you. First, uh, it was uh, seen as a symbolic uh, resolution. In other words, some scholars suggested that the ritual was more about resolving suspicions within the marriage and restoring harmony between the husband and wife. If, if no physical evidence emerged after the woman drank the bitter water, as it was called, uh, it could be seen as divine judgment that she was innocent, thereby, therefore uh, uh, resolving uh, the suspicions and uh, uh, restoring the couple's uh, relationship. Uh, another point of view is that it was a psychological uh, deterrent. Uh, others view it as a psychological deterrent, relying on the belief that the fear of divine punishment would lead a guilty party to confess before actually going through the ordeal. The psychological pressure alone might resolve the situation with the guilty party admitting fault in order to avoid the perceived consequences of, of divine uh, persecution. And then of course, uh, there was the idea of divine intervention. From a, a religious perspective, the ordeal was seen as a direct means of soliciting divine intervention to reveal the truth. The belief that was that uh, God would supernaturally indicate the woman's guilt or innocence through the physical effects of the water she drank. If she drank the water and survived it, she was innocent. If she drank the water and became ill, then that was a signal of her guilt. And then finally, the idea of social control. Uh, the ritual served as a method of social control, maintaining the social order and the sanctity of marriage. It uh, underscored the seriousness of marital fidelity and the consequences of, of violating uh, social, uh, social norms. You have to remember that uh, the, these uh, people lived very, very closely together for long periods of time. And so uh, it would be uh, natural that there would be temptation uh, and uh, marital infidelity uh, uh, occurring. And so the nature of the ritual, whether it actually determined guilt or not, was also a method to seek closure in a matter that if left unresolved could lead to greater emotional suffering and uh, or uh, violence. And then in chapter six, we have something called the Nazarite vow, the Nazarite vow, chapter six, one to 21. This vow described in number six, one to 21 is a, an ancient practice from the Hebrew Bible where individuals voluntarily committed themselves to a period of special consecration to God. So here's a, a summary of its history, its purpose, and its practice and the results uh, of the Nazarite vow on the individual. And so the concept of the Nazarite vow dates back to the time of the Israelites in the wilderness, of course. Notable figures like Samson and Samuel and possibly John the Baptist are thought to have been Nazarites, either for life or for specific periods. 
the, uh, the practice of this vow was rooted in the Israelite community's desire for individuals to demonstrate extraordinary religious dedication. Now the primary purpose of the Nazarite vow was to allow an individual to dedicate themselves to God in a special way, temporarily adopting stricter rules than those followed by the general population. This vow was a form of spiritual purification. It was also a physical manifestation of spiritual commitment and it was a means to seek a closer communion with, with God. And so the Nazarite vow involved three main prohibitions. First, abstinence from alcohol and grapes. Nazarites were forbidden from consuming any form of alcohol and grape products, symbolizing a lifestyle free from pleasures and indulgences that could distract them from spiritual uh, focus. Secondly, they were to avoid contact with the dead. The Nazarites could not come into contact with corpses, including those of family members. This maintained their ritual purity, a state necessary for someone with a heightened role in spiritual affairs. And then no cutting of the, the hair. Nazarites were not allowed to cut their hair during the period of the vow. The growing of the hair was a public symbol of their consecration and their dedication to God. And so the result of all of this was that at the end of the Nazarite period, specific rituals were performed, including offerings and the shaving of the head at the tabernacle or the temple. The, uh, the hair that was shaved off was burnt as a part of a peace offering, symbolizing the completion of the vow and a return to normal life for the individual. The offerings included a burnt offering, a sin offering, a peace offering, all signifying purification, atonement, and fellowship with God. Now, the completion of the vow was seen as a spiritually enriching experience, potentially bringing the Nazarite closer to God. This was the whole point of the thing. An individual wanted to grow closer to God and possibly conferring divine blessings and favor on that individual. The, uh, the vow not only affected the Nazarite, but also served as a powerful example of piety and sacrifice to the, to the broader community, highlighting the importance of dedication and spiritual purity. Overall, the Nazarite vow was a profound expression of faith, personal sacrifice, and spiritual discipline, reflecting an individual's desire to live a life set apart for uh, divine service to, uh, to God. So that's in chapter, chapter six. We move on uh, to chapter seven. And in this chapter, uh, Moses gives information about offerings, uh, but uh, offerings that were to be made by leaders. Uh, in number seven, verses one to 89, uh, following the construction of the tabernacle, the leaders of each tribe bring offerings for the dedication of the altar itself. This act symbolizes the unity and the commitment of all the tribes in supporting the worship and the service of God. Each tribe would see its particular leader uh, bringing a special sacrifice uh, to the tabernacle. Um, this uh, marked a high point of obedience and unity and devotion to God for the Israelite people. And I say that, I mean, in the history of their wanderings in the desert, this point right here, where all the tribal leaders gathered to offer a special sacrifice to God at the tabernacle, it was a, a high point, a high watermark. There was unity, there was purpose, there was obedience. Uh, we don't always, we will not, uh, always see this type of dedication as we continue to study uh, their wanderings in the wilderness. We get to chapter eight, and uh, here the, uh, Moses gives us cons uh, information about the consecration of the Levites. We know that the Levites were the individuals who were chosen to serve at the tabernacle. And so the Levites were set apart to serve in the tabernacle, as I said, uh, and, and this was taking the place of the firstborn. Now, 
Their dedication highlights the structured religious hierarchy and the central role of divine service in uh, daily life. And so this passage not only explains the ceremonial process of consecrating the Levites, but also provides the theological and the communal significance of this act. So let me give you a little background and purpose uh, for this. Uh, historically, the firstborn was considered special and belonged to God, especially as a memorial to the deliverance from Egypt that they had, uh, they had received, where the firstborn of the Egyptians perished while the Israelite firstborn were spared. However, after the sin of the golden calf, the Levites were chosen because of their steadfastness in remaining loyal to, uh, loyal to God during this period. So they were to be dedicated to the service of the tabernacle, taking the place of all the firstborn sons of Israel who originally had this role. And if you want to read more about this, go to Exodus uh, chapter 13, uh, verses one and two and verses 11 and 15. And so the practice of consecration, the Levites underwent a specific ritual of purification and dedication to underscore uh, their selection by God uh, to this special role in servants uh, to the tabernacle. So uh, first, uh, there would be cleansing rituals where the Levites were sprinkled with purifying water. They were instructed to shave their bodies and wash their clothes to symbolize their complete cleansing from impurity. Next, there was the presentation before the entire community. They were presented before the congregation and then before the tabernacle, symbolizing their formal introduction and integration into their roles as special servants of the community of God. Then there was the laying on of hands. The Israelites laid their hands on the Levites, signifying the transfer of responsibility from the firstborn to the Levites. This act established a symbolic connection between the community and the Levites and also endorsing them as their representatives. And then finally, there were the offerings and the sacrifices made. Uh, offerings were made on behalf of the Levites, which included both sin offerings for, their, for themselves, for their sins, and also burnt offerings that were essential for atonement and consecration to God's uh, service. Now, the taking of the Levites in place of the firstborn had several significant implications. For example, it institutionalized a system where a specific tribe was wholly dedicated to the religious and ceremonial duties of the community, centralizing and professionalizing uh, worship and ritual activities before uh, the leading in worship was done uh, by either the, um, the head of the family or the head of the tribe. And we see in uh, this uh, ritual a transfer of this responsibility to a, a particular class of individuals who were dedicated to doing that work. Uh, this act also symbolically continued the protection over the firstborn, redeeming them from their original consecration to divine service by substituting uh, the Levites. And then finally, the Levites' role reinforced the structure within Israelite community, clearly defining roles and duties that maintain the sanctity and the order necessary for their survival and their spiritual health. The Jews needed the uh, relationship that they had with God in order to survive, and their relationship with God uh, was expressed through uh, their uh, interaction uh, with the tabernacle, the offering of sacrifices, the, the making of vows, and so on and so forth. And the Levites, along with the priests, were the intermediaries that helped the people uh, accomplish these things uh, before God. And so we move on to uh, chapter nine. And here uh, we talk about the second Passover, Numbers chapter nine, verses one to 14. The people um, who are now at Mount Sinai have been in the wilderness for a second year as the day for the Passover feast approaches 
and they will celebrate this important feast for only the second time since their liberation from Egyptian slavery. However, a provision is made for those who were unclean or on a journey during the original Passover to allow them to celebrate it uh, a month later, thereby, thereby allowing them to comply with the purification and preparations that they were not able to complete on the day of the uh, original Passover uh, feast. This indulgence, this exception, if you will, emphasized God's inclusiveness and the importance that each individual participate in this communal worship. Imagine God is making exceptions in order to accommodate people who couldn't keep the, the rules and the regulations uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the celebration of the uh, Passover. All of this in order to demonstrate the importance of participating in this uh, critical feast. Uh, next is uh, the cloud and the fire. In Numbers 9, 15 to 23, the divine guidance provided by the cloud and fire ensured the Israelites uh, uh, traveled and camped under direct divine instruction, crucial for their survival and success. So here's some details about how these things function. Uh, they didn't travel according to what Moses said. Moses was a spokesman for God. As far as their traveling was concerned, uh, what decided their travel was the fire and the cloud. And so the cloud appeared during the day. It was a cloud that covered the tabernacle, specifically the tent of a testimony. The fire was at night. The cloud appeared as fire, making it visible uh, in, the, uh, in the darkness. And so uh, there was a particular purpose for the cloud and the fire. For example, the primary function of the cloud and fire was to guide the Israelites on their journey. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites were to break camp and follow it. When the cloud settled, the Israelites were to stop and to set up camp once again. Um, the movement of the cloud dictated when the Israelites moved and when they stayed. This divine signaling ensured that the Israelites traveled and rested according to God's timing, which could vary from a few days to a longer period in a single location. And then the cloud and fire were physical representations of God's presence among his people. It reassured them of his direct involvement and protection in their lives. If somebody woke up in the morning and wasn't sure, what am I doing here? Why are we doing this? Is God really with us? He just had to see the constant cloud that was over the tabernacle and at night to witness the fire that gave light. It's dark in the wilderness. It's dark in the desert at night. And that fire provided a light for them each and every uh, evening. Now, the cloud and the fire served multiple purposes. First, they were constant. They were a visible sign of God's guidance and protection, crucial for maintaining the morale of a people who were journeying through a harsh wilderness. Also, the manifestations provided a practical mechanism for travel logistics, helping to organize and move a large community efficiently. Uh, there was no doubt as to when they had to stop uh, or move or in what direction they were to go. The cloud and the fire uh, provided this uh, information. Remember, there were uh, you know, at least a million and a half people uh, in uh, that uh, grouping. And then finally, the presence of God through the cloud and fire emphasized the holiness of the tabernacle and the need for the Israelites to maintain purity and uh, obedience. And I can't emphasize this enough, to maintain purity of, and obedience because God was in their midst. God was actually present with them. And so all of the regulations and all of the rules uh, served to prepare them to live in such close proximity uh, to uh, the divine presence. And so their journey and life rhythm were directly tied to God's will as demonstrated by the movement of the cloud and the fire. This dynamic underscored a profound level of divine human interaction where God's 
immediate presence and direction were tangible. Day and night, they were always made aware of God's presence. Wherever and whenever uh, the people could visibly confirm that God was actually with them. All right, let's move on to uh, chapter 10. And in chapter 10, uh, Moses writes about the silver trumpets, chapter 10, verses one to 10. The uh, purpose of the silver trumpets that were made, uh, first of all, to call the community. The trumpets were used for summoning the whole community or the leaders when they were blown in a, a certain manner. Also, they were used to signal the start of the camp's movements during their journey through the uh, wilderness. The trumpets were sounded uh, to call the Israelites to arms and to signal the need for God's help in battle, ensuring his remembrance and his assistance of his people. And the trumpets were also to be blown over the offerings during festivals and on the first day of the month integrating them into the religious celebrations and sacrificial ceremonies. So the trumpets were a normal part of uh, daily life uh, as well as their uh, religious life. They were used in a particular way. Uh, a long blast was used for assembling the leaders while a series of short blasts indicated it was time for the camp to set out. The uh, blasts directed specific tribes when to gather and in what order to commence their march. And so the silver trumpets served as tools for communication and coordination, vital in maintaining order among a large group of people. Obviously, no cell phones, no TV, none of that. So there had to be a way to uh, communicate with uh, all of the people or certain people of the community. They also held religious significance incorporating the aspect of divine guidance in both daily activities and in special occasions. The sound of the trumpets was a reminder of God's presence and a call to worship, uh, fostering a sense of community and shared spiritual practice. Everybody, everybody heard the trumpets. It's a little bit like the sirens that go off at noon uh, here in Oklahoma, the sirens that uh, are tested uh, at noon every Saturday, a familiar thing to those of us who live here in, um, in Oklahoma, uh, the uh, tornado uh, warning system. Well, they had the trumpets uh, warning them, but also calling them to assembly uh, and also used to celebrate various uh, festivals. And so this use of the trumpets underscores their role in organizing a, a nomadic community guiding their movements, enhancing their religious observances, and reinforcing social bonding and their connection uh, to, the, uh, to the divine. Also in chapter 10, we have information about their uh, preparation uh, for departure from Sinai in verses 11 to 36. You have to realize the people have been given their camping and marching orders. They have made the trumpets to provide signals and instructions and the cloud above the tabernacle enables them to know without a doubt if they are to remain camped or to break camp and to begin to travel following that very same cloud by day and that pillar of light by night. The Israelites departure from Sinai marked the beginning of their journey toward the promised land led by the ark and directed by Moses with God's guidance. We have to realize that they spent nearly two years at Mount Sinai. When you're reading it, you don't realize how long uh, they spent there, but at Mount Sinai, you know, they, many things took place. And Moses uh, received the law. They built all the elements for the tabernacle. The, there was this, the sin with the golden calf and the punishment and the teaching that went on and so on and so forth, the, the, the silver trumpets that were made. So they spent uh, quite a bit of time at uh, Mount Sinai, but now it was time to leave that particular uh, area and uh, begin uh, traveling. And so in chapter 11 uh, begins the trouble. You know, we've had uh, relatively uh, not too much trouble in Sinai, but once they, uh, they hit the road, uh, we see in chapter 11, uh, the trouble begins and it begins with complaints about their hardships. 
in chapter 11, one to 35, the people begin to complain about their hardships and the manna that they were receiving from heaven, leading Moses to feel the burden of leadership. And so God miraculously provides quail for meat and appoints 70 elders to assist Moses, showing his responsiveness to both the physical and the governance needs of the people. Moses asked for help, God provided uh, the 70 elders. The people asked for something different other than manna, God provides the uh, quail. Now uh, uh, there's a brief mention of God punishing the people, sending a plague for their greedy consumption of the quail that he uh, provided them. This we will see is a sign of the trouble ahead as the people after more than a year in the wilderness begin to grow impatient to arrive at their destination. And at one point they actually consider a return uh, to Egypt. And so the journey from Egypt to the land of Canaan under direct and uninterrupted travel conditions would not have taken very long uh, geographically. I mean, the distance between Egypt and Canaan is roughly 200 to 250 miles, depending on the specific starting point and end point. And so if the Israelites had traveled directly from Egypt to Canaan, without the significant delays and long stops described in the Bible, I mean, the trip could have been completed relatively uh, quickly. Here are a few, uh, a few things to consider when you're looking at that uh, scenario. Uh, assuming an average walking speed and a manageable daily distance for a large group, including children and elderly people and livestock, the Israelites might have covered about 10 to 15 miles uh, a day. Uh, at this rate, the journey from Egypt to Canaan could have taken about two to three weeks under direct and ideal, you know, uh, no sandstorms, no illnesses, no terrible accidents, you know, all things considered, it should have only taken several weeks to a month to uh, complete the trip. However, Exodus through Deuteronomy describe a much longer period of wandering in the wilderness, actually 40 years. This extended time was due to a combination of divine judgment for lack of faith and disobedience and the need for formation and preparation of the Israelites as a covenant community before entering the promised land. You have to understand these people were slaves for centuries. They had no army, they had no government, they, have no, they had no formal worship organization, uh, nothing like that. And so they weren't really ready to go in and take over uh, a land where there were uh, established cities and armies and so on and so forth. All of that preparation uh, would, have would, would have taken place during the 40 years uh, they were in, uh, in the desert. And so the actual journey as described in the Bible involved uh, much more than simply moving from one geographical location to another. It, it was a significant spiritual and communal development process for the Israelites. Then when we get to uh, chapter 12, uh, we have the problem that arises with uh, Miriam and Aaron as they uh, oppose uh, Moses. And, and so the story follows in this way. Uh, Aaron and Miriam begin to speak against Moses because of his marriage to a Cushite woman. And so their criticism, however, extended beyond his, cho uh, his choice of a spouse. They actually questioned Moses' unique role as God's prophet. And so they said, has the Lord, and I quote, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? So this, this question, this rhetorical question by them reflected a challenge to the exclusive authority that Moses seemed to hold. The Lord heard their complaint and summoned Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to the tent of meeting. And then God appeared in a pillar of a cloud at the entrance to the tent. When I say the tent of meeting, the tent of meeting was a place where God would meet with individuals. And this was before the tabernacle was fully finished and, uh, and functioning. And so God explicitly affirmed Moses' special status as the most faithful servant who had a unique relationship with him different than any other prophet. 
Miriam uh, was then struck with leprosy as punishment for her insubordination and Aaron pleaded uh, for her healing. Miriam was shut out of the camp for seven days uh, after which uh, she was healed and then allowed to return. Of course, she was with uh, leprosy, she was ceremonially uh, unclean. And so there, there are plenty of reasons uh, for their reaction. I want to provide you a couple. Uh, first of all, ethnic or cultural prejudice. Their initial focus on Moses' Cushite wife suggests possible ethnic or cultural biases. In other words, uh, Moses' wife is not one of us. The Cushite, likely referring to a person from Cush, a region that was south of Egypt, might have been seen as an outsider. And this could have fueled discontent, especially if there were underlying concerns about leadership and authority. Can you, can you not just hear it? Well, is he really our leader? I mean, after all, his wife is not even one of us. Um, jealousy and envy, natural, uh, natural sins, of course. Aaron and Miriam might have felt overshadowed by Moses' central role as leader and mediator between God and the people. As his siblings, they were also leaders among the people, but they did not have the same level of direct communication with God. Uh, also as prominent figures themselves, you know, Aaron being the high priest and Miriam was recognized as a prophetess, they could have perceived that the balance of power was disproportionately in favor of Moses. And so their questioning of whether God has spoken only through him uh, may have been an indication uh, of this, uh, you know, their idea of their power dynamics going on. And then of course, from a theological perspective, this event could be viewed as a test of Moses' humility and his leadership ability as well as a lesson for the community regarding the importance of respecting divinely appointed leaders. This incident highlights the complexities of leadership and the challenges that can arise even among close relatives when significant power and spiritual authority are at stake. Uh, are at stake. It also underscores the biblical theme and that leadership uh, appointed by God comes with divine expectations and also divine protections. And so even though we've uh, had a wide variety of events that we've looked at today and, and personal interactions in these eight chapters of Numbers, I wanna share a few lessons that we can draw from these and apply them to ourselves today as followers of Jesus. First of all, Holiness and purity are important in church life. Those words don't only apply to people in the Old Testament. These chapters repeatedly stress the need for holiness and purity among the Israelites, from the removal of the unclean from the camp in chapter five, to the Nazarite vow in chapter six, to the purification and dedication of the Levites in chapter eight. The text underlines that spiritual purity is crucial, not just for individual holiness, but also for the health and integrity of the entire body, the church. Your purity and devotion spark this kind of attitude in me. We must set the bar at a high point for it to have an impact on everyone. No one in or out of the church is impressed by believers who easily tolerate worldliness in their speech, their dress, or their actions. I mean, we're supposed to be different. That's the whole point of making a witness uh, for Christ. Another lesson we can draw, we seek divine guidance. When I say we, I mean we as a people, we as the people of God, we seek to follow divine guidance. These chapters elaborate on the theme of divine guidance, particularly through the depiction of the cloud and the fire over the tabernacle you know, in chapter nine. The Israelites were to move and encamp based on these divine signals. This narrative emphasizes the importance of seeking and following divine direction in all endeavors, teaching that true success comes from aligning one's actions with divine will and timing. The entire idea 
uh, of the restoration movement, for example, is that we are guided solely by the directions given to us in the New Testament. The New Testament is our pillar of smoke and fire. And then finally, leadership and accountability are necessary for success. These chapters also focus on leadership, particularly in the roles of Moses and Aaron and the Levites, and how leaders are held to high standards of accountability. For instance, the criticism and punishment of Miriam and Aaron in chapter 12 for speaking against Moses highlight the necessity of respecting divinely chosen leaders and the consequences of undermining their authority. This underscores the lesson that leadership is a responsibility that requires humility, respect for authority, and accountability. I mean, the quickest way to destroy a congregation of the Lord's church is to sow discord among the leaders or encourage members to criticize or undermine the elders' leadership by lack of enthusiastic response or support for their leadership roles and the direction that they're setting uh, for the church. So together, these lessons from Numbers teach us about living a life that is directed by spiritual principles, governed by divine authority, and conducted within a framework of congregational unity and purity. These principles are crucial for maintaining order and fostering spiritual growth, not only for ourselves, but also for the congregation that we are a part of. We risk the same kind of wilderness wandering and lack of growth when we disregard the Spirit's lead, when we allow something other than holiness and purity to become our first priority and undermine the leadership we have instead of supporting those who have been appointed to watch over our souls. All right, well, that's uh, the lesson uh, for today. Let me show you what our assignment is uh, before we get to our next uh, lesson. I want you to reread chapters five to 12, hopefully with the information I've provided uh, for you in this class. Uh, these chapters now as you read them will become more meaningful. And then in preparation for our next class, I want you to read chapters 13 to 20. All right, thank you for being with us. Pray that God blesses you and we'll see you next time.